When I remove the chip, So, welcome for uh, the launch of uh, Benchmarking Work in Europe 2021 on unequal uh, Europe and inequality. And uh, it's just out of the printing uh, today. And, uh, you have all the chapter on internet and I uh, encourage you to uh, download. It's the uh, key publication from the ETUC and ETUI. And we uh, kept the good tradition to have the launch, uh, unfortunately for the second time, not in presence in the nice premise uh, of uh, ACA Europa and EGB, but uh, online, but with uh, our partner, uh, and we're happy to, to continue this tradition. It is really important uh, to have this tradition. Uh, it's also a, an important, uh, because it, it tackles uh, the key question of, of inequality. And if you remember, uh, we had uh, 10 years ago in 2012, another issue uh, after the, the first crisis about inequality, so 10 years, <laughs> after this question remain at the center uh, of the uh, problem uh, in Europe, but not only in Europe, uh, in, in the world. So I will not have a, a very long discourse because I, as you will see, there is a, a lot of presentation and we are here more uh, to uh, listen to the, 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 the presenter and the, the data that you will find as always, a lot of table, a, a lot of graph, which help to, to see what are the development, but also to compare the different uh, countries. And uh, without saying uh, more, except thank you to all the participants, I, I give you uh, the floor. Yeah, dear colleagues, dear friends, thank you, Philip, for the invitation. And first of all, thank you uh, for the joint presentation of this uh, benchmarking working. Europe report. I think it has become already a very good tradition that we work together, that we presented uh, together. And uh, I think it's a, it's an important uh, date every year that we present it together. So thank you very much for this. You mentioned uh, the title Unequal Europe, the title of this Benchmarking Working Europe report 2021. And uh, despite these uncertain times, uh, one thing we can be sure that the benchmarking publication, which has been a, cons a constant in many trade unionist diaries for many years. And it is an important resource for all of us, for trade unions, uh, but also for politicians and also for us in the workers group of the EESC, that we have this data, that we have this data together and uh, compiled, and we have a good picture uh, of what is at stake at the moment. So it is very helpful, and it's particularly helpful about that uh, this edition, uh, that it brings together all the key dimensions concerning inequality in the world of work in one publication. I think this is important and I think many of us, many of us trade unionists are familiar with the arguments uh, concerning inequality in the labor market, inequality in wages, in collective bargaining. And this is, I would say, comfortable ground. And the benchmarking provides us with a vital update on current developments so that we can continue to press forward with our long-standing demands for higher wages and stronger collective uh, bargaining. And we all know that the, the uh, Directive on Adequate Minimum Wages um, is now not only under discussion, comes really in the crucial phase, and we hope very much um, that uh, Europe will deliver, will deliver in order to strengthen uh, collective bargaining and fair minimum wages across Europe. 
I don't want to mention many numbers, just two of them, uh, which show the need for urgent action. 24 million workers across Europe earn a minimum wage below the poverty line. I think this already is one reason why Europe has to be active and has to take action. The second one, even more alarming, only two in five workers currently enjoy collectively negotiated wages in the EU. This is also one of the reasons why we have more inequalities in wage distribution, in wealth distribution. And we, we know that in countries where collective bargaining is stronger, we have higher wages and we have a better distribution, a fairer distribution of wages. Also, the gender aspect is much more better in countries with high collective bargaining coverage. So, colleagues, just uh, because I don't have a lot of time, but I would like to mention two points. I'm very pleased in particular uh, that there is a chapter on industrial democracy and inequality written by Simon Deakin. Uh, I have to say in the EESC workers group, we uh, recently set up a so-called interest group, we call it category, for more de democracy at work to foster um, workers' participation, workers' involvement, to have a strong and mandatory workers' voice uh, across Europe. And uh, I think the report now, which is currently debated and voted in the European Parliament, shows also that we've, we are facing here a momentum. We are facing a momentum, and I think we should use it to push for stronger, for stronger legal uh, framework. And uh, we all know that the ETUC is doing it. And uh, also the other unions and also the workers group is strongly uh, supporting uh, this, uh, this campaign, let's say it like this. Um, last year's benchmarking offered us some cautious hope that we can capitalize on this crisis to bring about a stronger social Europe. This cautious hope remains. However, as we move towards a new COVID future, there are signs all around that we cannot take it for granted that the changes we know as so desperately needed will take place without a determined struggle. Therefore, this year's benchmarking starkly reminds us of what is at stake. We have a huge responsibility and task ahead if we are turn the tide on inequality in Europe. And once again, the 2021 benchmarking provides us with another important weapon in our fight on the policy background policy battleground, actually. We know, and I will stop here, but we know that um, huge challenges lie ahead of us. Uh, I just remind all, all of us that um, we cannot accept that human rights law, including workers' rights, will disappear from the Commission plans when it comes to a directive on human rights due diligence. We also call on the Commission to deliver an ambitious legislative initiative on improving the working conditions in platform work. And I'm really grateful for the strong activities of the, of the ETUC in this respect. And last but not least, when we speak about strengthening collective bargaining, then we should speak also about public procurement, no public contracts to, uh, to um, enterprises which do not respect decent work and which do not respect collective bargaining. I would like to thank all the colleagues at the ETUI and the ETUC for this very valuable work and to say a special thanks also to Kate Pickett and Simon Deacon for their contributions and for being with us today. And I haven't mentioned all of you, but of course, I'm really happy also that everything is here. And uh, once again, thank you very much, uh, Philip and Luca, for the invitation. It's me? Yes, it's you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for organizing this presentation to the EGI uh, with the other uh, subject that, uh, as usual, cooperate to host and, and deliver this, uh, this discussion. Uh, I think, uh, uh, well, the benchmarking this year is particularly crucial because we are trying to get out from the pandemic, but we are still facing all the consequences of this pandemic, and these consequences are dramatic. And having decided, uh, uh, thanks to the EGI, to focus the reflection of the benchmarking on inequalities, I think is the right angle uh, to try to build a strategy, a way out uh, in this respect. The discussion inequalities, uh, I mean, uh, was there also before the pandemic hit, because uh, we were facing already until a couple of years ago, uh, a recovery that happened after the financial and the economic crisis 2008 2011 
for a few years we had a recovery, but that recovery was totally unequal. It was a recovery without proper uh, quality job creation. Uh, it's true that we had more jobs uh, created in Europe uh, in that uh, phase, but at the same time, the work hours uh, didn't increase at all. So this means that we have, ju have just created a lot, a number of uh, unstable, precarious, and very uh, low protected jobs uh, as a consequence of the austerity measures that were implemented as a wrong reaction, I would say, uh, to the financial and economic crisis that took place uh, before. So uh, it's not that kind of uh, recovery that we want uh, to build now. And, uh, but this means that clearly uh, uh, the kind of inequalities that were generated by the crisis, uh, by the wrong uh, solutions that were uh, pushed forward after the crisis, that inequality has been even further exacerbated by the, the consequences of COVID. Uh, so reflecting on inequalities is the fundamental starting point we want to build a strategy to create a more sustainable economy, society, and the good market in the European Union. Something that is really inclusive and that can really give equal opportunities to everybody uh, to participate uh, in, in the kind of recovery uh, that we want to build. Uh, there are some important areas, I think, that are uh, also uh, uh, to some extent uh, described in the report where inequalities have unfortunately raised even further uh, during the pandemic and after uh, the pandemic. Just to mention a few, uh, even health has become a territory for inequalities because the accession to uh, cures was not equal for all the categories of citizens in the European Union during the pandemic. Uh, there were people that were of course, obliged to continue working, putting their lives at risk because they were the so-called essential workers, frontline workers, what we call the heroes of the pandemic, and the protection for them was not adequate. This has created even further unequal condition uh, for, for these categories of workers, but then there are all the others, those that have been suspended from work, and again, uh, even the very ambitious and effective emergency measures that have been deployed by the European institutions, including SURE, uh, well, they have not reached everybody in the same way. Uh, it's true that 40 million workers in Europe have been supported by these emergency measures, but there are tens of millions of precarious workers, uh, non-standard workers, self-employed workers that didn't receive anything during the pandemic. So there is still, again, a divide in our labor market, even when the European Union was able uh, to provide extraordinary measures for support during the outbreak that we have faced. So uh, even uh, in managing the pandemic, despite of the efforts and the great ambitious initiatives that the European Union was able to take, still inequality implementation has taken place, unfortunately. Not to mention vaccination, we are still a totally unequal distribution of vaccines, uh, uh, not only in the world, but even within the European Union. The measures put in place by the different countries are completely uh, random. Uh, there is no coordination, despite the efforts of the European Commission. As you know, there is no mandate, there is no competence uh, from the European Union when it comes to health, unfortunately. They did what they could, but still we have a completely uneven situation when it comes uh, to uh, the, the, the ways, uh, let's say, the, the pandemic itself and the vaccination campaigns have been implemented. So uh, even when we discuss about health and emergency linked to the pandemic, uh, we didn't manage to reduce inequalities as we would have uh, uh, liked uh, in this respect. And then, of course, uh, there is the economy. And here, again, as I say, uh, uh, an horrible economic and financial crisis unequal recovery after that, then COVID hit. Now we are paving the path for, uh, for recovery and resilience uh, through the next generation EU plan, a lot of money put at disposal of the different member states uh, to, uh, to uh, build a, a sustainable recovery, but still we don't have the guarantees and the instruments to make sure that this money will be disbursed in a way that will really create uh, quality job opportunities for all. We don't have still monitoring mechanisms in the different national recovery plans to make sure that this can go in the right direction. There is still a lot of work to do to make sure that we can really build what we have called 
uh, in the blog we had co-signed with Nicola and Philippe, but also in the in the foreword to the report, what we call a new, different, more sustainable, inclusive economic model. Uh, we cannot go back to business as usual. Also, this rhetoric about building back better or a new normal to be built, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, this is not what we need. Uh, we need something completely new. We need a completely new narrative. We need a completely new economic governance to build a different economic model that is really sustainable, inclusive, and equal. And to do that, you know, it's not just about slogans. We need policies. We need rules that have to be reformed radically if we want to really to uh, go in the right direction in this respect. Uh, as you know, we are in a very crucial moment in this, in this sense because there is the public consultation about the revision of the economic governance rules, the fiscal rules, the stability and growth pact. We have the national recovery plans that have to be uh, implemented. And I think that in this respect, this is a fundamental tool for decision makers, even before and for us, for decision makers, for the European Commission, for the national governments, for the local authorities, they should really look at this data to understand in what direction they should drive and steer their recovery plans and also the review of the European economic governance. I was recently told by Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni, please reply to the European consultation. Make sure that not only you know, governments or just the EQC replies. We need to make sure that each and every national trade union will provide a reply the ETY will provide a reply based on this benchmarking report. Each and every uh, think tank linked to the progressive family, uh, uh, the, uh, the members of the European Parliament, uh, uh, NGOs, uh, civil society organizations, we are really to make sure that we can create a momentum, that we can boost a real campaign to make sure that the revision of the rules, the revision of our economic model, can really change in the right uh, direction. And last but not least, of course, uh, what Oliver was already mentioning, uh, it's not enough to change the economic model. We have also to change our social model because our social model has been disrupted by the financial crisis and now by the pandemic. Public services, social rights, uh, social protection systems, they have been destroyed and the capacity of covering everybody in an equal way is not there any longer. We have really to rebuild it. Uh, legislative initiatives are very important. We are really uh, lobbying and acting very, very intensively I mean, to make sure that these uh, fundamental legislative initiatives, minimum wages, pay transparency, platform work, uh, due diligence, uh, workers' participation, and so on and so forth can really be delivered properly. But we need more in general to make sure that the 20 principles that are part of the European pillar of social rights, the action plans for the implementation of the pillar, the social progress protocol, all these elements become an integral part of the European policy of the semester of the economic governance and also the treaties. So we have really great challenges in front of us if we want to make sure that the quality becomes really the core of the European project. And in this respect, uh, to conclude, I think that this book is really a fundamental starting point and also something that can really feed the debate in, in the right direction. So thank you very much, guys, for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oliver. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to very, very quickly uh, uh, illustrate uh, how the rest of the discussion will take place, and also with uh, my colleague Agnieszka Piana, who's uh, uh, joining us, give you a taster of uh, some of the key messages that you will find into this extremely comprehensive uh, publication, which, uh, as has been mentioned before, it's a big publication, it's a flagship product, and it's data driven. So you will find uh, a, a substantial amount of uh, highly uh, accessible visual information uh, rich with data to back up uh, the analysis and the arguments that are contained in, in, in the document itself. But uh, uh, before I do that, before we do that, I would also like to uh, thank the co-organizers, uh, OKB, Aka Europa, and of course uh, the ETUC for their support. I would like to thank the great team 
behind this uh, uh, product, this project and product. All my colleagues uh, here at uh, the ATI, um, in particular, uh, uh, the colleagues from uh, uh, Compute, both for the production, their efforts in the production process and in the communication of this process. Uh, the editors, Sotiria and Romek, who are also authors, you will hear from uh, Sotiria uh, presenting on uh, chapter one uh, in a few minutes. Then I would also like to thank uh, Philippe. Uh, for all the hard work, the encouragement, and in fact, for coming up with the idea in the first place. Um, may I also take a second to thank, in particular, uh, our uh, uh, guest uh, authors, uh, Professor Kim Piquet, who has uh, written the uh, guest editorial and has really provided uh, intellectual clarity and uh, intellectual inspiration. Uh, for the project as a, as a whole, and Professor Simon Dichin, who has uh, has already been uh, uh, mentioned by um, um, uh, Oliver Rocke, is the author of uh, uh, chapter six. Um, the rest of the chapters have been uh, uh, written, uh, co-authored, and uh, co-produced by uh, our ETI uh, researchers. An amazing pool uh, of talent, a unique credit to the institution and uh, to the labor movement uh, as a whole. So thank you very much. Uh, the rest of the uh, event will proceed uh, after the brief presentation by Agnieszka and myself, and the slides have already been uh, uploaded uh, on, on the screen, on your screens, with um, a panel discussion chaired by Paula Franklin. Paula uh, is uh, uh, a senior researcher here at the ETI. She has also coordinated and co-authored the production of her chapter five, and she will lead an extremely interesting panel discussion where uh, we have the privilege of uh, being joined by Barbara Kaufman, the Director for Employment uh, and Social Governance uh, and Analysis at DG Employment in the European Commission, uh, Luca Vicentini himself, uh, and uh, uh, Evelyn Regner, uh, an MEP uh, from the group of the Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats uh, in the European Parliament, and then there will be also uh, a conversation and a more in-depth, substantial uh, discussion of some of the chapters in the book uh, with uh, Sotiria Theodoropoulou, who, as well as being the editor of this, uh, one of the editors of this volume has authored uh, chapter one, uh, Kate Piquet, uh, a professor of epidemiology in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York, and uh, uh, Professor Simon Likin, uh, from the University of Cambridge. Um, so this is the program, and uh, uh, I think now falls on uh, myself and Agnieszka to give you a 15-minute overview of some of the key findings from uh, this year's uh, volume. Uh, Luca has already uh, illustrated some of the key messages uh, extremely effectively, and uh, uh, Oliver has offered uh, uh, plenty more uh, information and context. Uh, uh, thank you very much for taking the publication uh, so seriously. Um, but clearly, uh, there is substantial evidence emerging from our work that inequalities have really been exacerbated uh, by the current pandemic. And we can really see in all its uh, uh, might how inequalities are indeed a multidimensional problem. But it's also extremely clear to us uh, through the work that the colleagues have done that, uh, of course, inequalities predate the pandemic. And uh, they are for all purposes, and they should be treated as a structural problem. So they are the natural product of the functioning of our economic and social model. Of course, uh, they are uh, linked to the pandemic. Of course, they're also linked to the previous uh, recession, linked to the financial and economic crisis of 2008 and 2009, and the austerity response. But we have really uh, identified data, some of which will be discussed uh, in the course of uh, uh, the PANA conversation later on, that suggest that growing inequalities uh, have uh, uh, come to the fore at, uh, at a visibly accelerated pace since the 1970s, 1980s. And there's a genuine distributional problem uh, in most European uh, countries, just as uh, there's a genuine distributional problem beyond 
uh, Europe. Agnieszka? Yes, thank you. Um, so as, as the problem uh, is structural, as Nicola said, um, the responses to the, to the inequalities that predate the COVID crisis, but also to the effects of COVID crisis, they cannot be really understood in terms of emergency or temporary measures. So it's putting a small patch or a band-aid on something that's it's falling apart and clearly does not work. So what we do advocate and what we try to show with evidence in benchmarking is that more structural responses are needed. And certainly the thinking must be much more long-term than just one or two years of the pandemic and then withdrawal of emergency measures and going back to the usual business because that way we will just end up where we've been before the crisis with deepening inequalities. On a positive note, there are some of those as well. We've seen that uh, different policies are possible to be implemented. It was the crisis that um, prompted the introduction or accelerated uh, some measures that were being in the pipeline, they were being discussed at a much slower pace before the COVID crisis, but they did. They were they were implemented, and it will. We've seen that alternatives do exist. There just must be um, a push factor or a will at much higher level and much more consistent to to implement the, the novel responses and uh, and solutions. So I will now. Um, uh, I, I will briefly show some of the um, data and analysis uh, carried out, you know, presented in benchmarking. I, it's not an attempt to tell the whole story because it's not possible to uh, summarize 200 pages of very rich uh, evidence uh, and analysis in, in 10 or 15 minutes. But just a, a first note is on the um, importance of uh, realizing the complexity and the depth of, of the current crisis. So how, how the labor market was affected and which groups did suffer. What we do see as a first uh, key message is that um, effect was not equal, although that was something uh, raised at the beginning of the crisis, that it's not economic crisis in principle, it's a health crisis, it should not follow the uh, usual socioeconomic divides. Well, it did. And the lines that it followed to, to great extent were created by the uh, deregulatory de policies that preceded the, the COVID crisis. So we've seen that precarious employment that grew before the COVID crisis, it continued to grow, uh, suffered much more, um, protected the core uh, um, stable employment, suffered much less in proportion. It was the precarious and more vulnerable workers in uh, atypical contracts, in part-time jobs that experienced out of proportionate um, employment losses, job losses. We also see the risk of this being a long-term exclusion from the labor market, just because of their weaker attachment of the worse quality of their jobs, less stability, and um, different difference in the protective measures, so the different access to social support, to social security by more precarious workers. So we do see that the legacy uh, persisted and it affected much more uh, vulnerable groups um, to greater extent. Now, the policy experimentation was a very, very welcome sign, and that started quite early in the crisis. The SURE program, the job retention schemes were rolled out already in March, April of 2020, so almost a year and a half ago. The take-up was also impressive. It was about a quarter of, uh, of the EU workforce that applied for those schemes in the first two or three months of, of their uh, operation. So it was a very different approach than uh, that the deregulation or um, internal uh, internal devaluation after the, COVID, the the financial crisis of 2008. Um, job retention schemes they acted as economic stabilizer because people were able to retain the income and uh, employment. They stabilized internal demand. However. Um, We've seen also with the SURE program that it was financial support that um, helped the member states, but there was not much in terms of institutional solutions or institutional support. Therefore, the inequality that persisted or institutional differences that existed across countries before the pandemic, they were reproduced. The take up was very unequal of those measures, measures across countries. And um, Despite many attempts to make uh, the measures more inclusive, to also open them up to non-standard workers, to um, fixed-term contracts or self-employed, it did not work out that well, which we also see in the benchmarking that shows that 
um, the, the, the cushioning of job losses was really mainly targeted at full-time open-ended contracts and not at precarious workers who are most in need in terms of uh, being exposed to low income and much more uh, unstable employment. So having learned so much, having seen so many new solutions put on the table with respect to job retention schemes, is it a good idea to abandon them after one year? Or perhaps it's, um, it's a good first step to make those more systematic and more uh, institutionalized solution to uh, ensuring unemployment and ensuring risks that do emerge uh, with regulat regulatory um, in European labor markets. Now, all the, the COVID crisis also accelerated many of the trends that were unfolding long before um, the COVID crisis. So one of that is the technological change, digitalization and automation. And the new uh, aspect of the visions uh, that emerged in, in this pandemic was how far a job can be performed from home. So the word teleworkability uh, emerged in classifying workers into those who are more likely to retain their jobs and incomes, and those who are not only more insecure in terms of job, job loss, but also in terms of health exposure and health risks. Um, as, as I uh, show here in, in the slide, it, oh, there, there existed a huge difference across European countries. So within the EU, there was a very different readiness to adopt um, telework or working from home, but that differed even more within countries. And there was a huge occupational and socioeconomic gradient in take up of, of telework and possibility work to work from home. Now, there are obviously many of the risks and opportunities created by, by this development. We, need, we should not forget about uh, work-life balance or work-life conflict and psychosocial risks related to uh, working remotely, being isolated or supervised through technology by the employer. But what is also important uh, is that um, workers uh, moved from the premises of the employer was put in their homes and really only connected through technology, they do resemble the gig economy or at least remote platform work and the, this mode of organizing employment. It removes one of the key aspects of employment, which is the fixed place of work. And it does open the possibility to outsource across borders many of, of the jobs and many of, uh, of, of the tasks. So that also creates different type of um, development, also with its chances and risks. Um, and algorithmic management being one of that, but also the way the work is then uh, protected. Is, will that be still employment relationship or uh, new forms such as in the platform economy where it will take over, which are cheaper to the employers and offer much less protection to workers? And also uh, we should not forget that these are vulnerable workers that quite often do take up jobs in the gig economy. So if anything, the protection should be greater for those workers and then attention should be directed at coming up with new protective measures and not, um, not deregulation and allowing this to unfold on its own. Um, and I will finish with the um, second important trend, which is gender inequality, which it was closing in, in various ways, for instance, with men being harder hit by the previous crisis. But what we see with this uh, crisis is that we really should not only talk about labor market when we talk about gender equality or inequality. It is really the vicious or virtuous cycle between the division of unpaid and care work in the, in, at home and um, the situation of women and men that differs in paid employment. So we saw that um, because there is difference in the division of, uh, for instance, time divided between parents on childcare or household tasks, then um, the labor market, uh, labor market outcomes also impact what's happening uh, at home. So when jobs uh, with telework taken up in the, in the pandemic, we saw that the second earner or person earning less was pushed out of the labor force and then took up the um, the home tasks more often. So this is really important to see that, uh, that if there's an equal division at home, that uh, segments also the labor market and vice versa. We also show in very short focus the gender segmentation that persists within occupations and sectors. So women were those frontline workers, but they were really just, well, they're not appreciated as heroes and instead they are exposed um, to more psychosocial risks. 
So this is also an important aspect and that, that is uncovered in a separate chapter of, of benchmarking, looking at health and safety. And there is quite marked difference between men and women in the way it affects them. Um, I think I will stop here and hand to Nicola because it, it is a very broad topic and it merits much deeper uh, explanation, but I fear we only have about five or seven minutes left. So Nicola, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Agnieszka. It is indeed just uh, uh, a taste that we just want to whet your appetite. You will find the main course in the chapters, in the 200 pages of, uh, of the issue itself. Um, uh, you, you can see here some slides that have been uh, produced by the, my colleagues, the authors of chapter three, uh, dealing with uh, wages, uh, Torsten, Wouter, and Kurten. Uh, chapter three, uh, uh, depicts uh, a very worrying picture in terms of uh, 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 the wage uh, situation in, in Europe. It, it certainly points out that after the uh, uh, very rapid collapse of uh, wage growth in 2020, nominal wages, that nominal wages started recovering slightly in uh, the uh, early months of 2021, but it also uh, points out very vividly that uh, the outlook is extremely uncertain due to a number of uh, these uh, key measurements uh, uh, currently developing uh, and having some inherent biases, but in particular, uh, the uh, potential for inflation, inflationary pressures that are becoming more marked in the second part of uh, 2021 to start eating into nominal increases. And here we can see that uh, uh, real wage growth is not is certainly not as substantial. Overall, the picture remains bleak. Uh, what is clear at the moment is that wage inequality increased substantially during the pandemic, both in terms of uh, the distribution between the top and lower percentiles on the wage distribution scale, but also, as uh, Agnieszka was uh, alluding in the previous slide, between men and women. And secondly, as the table on the right uh, shows, real wage developments typically have uh, fallen well behind labor productivity in 2021. And Agnieszka pointed out how some of the new work arrangements that came to fruition during the pandemic have indeed increased uh, labor productivity, partly because of uh, 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 technological investments. Uh, and here we can see that a vast share of the working population in Europe uh, is struggling to receive a fair share of their labor and the productivity growth that they have uh, generated in very, very difficult times. Uh, the previous slides of Agnieszka were celebrating uh, the importance of uh, income support and uh, uh, sometimes income substitution measures, but what should also be celebrated in Europe much more is the resilience of labor during the pandemic. Um, we know, and the first table clearly points out this, that uh, uh, higher levels of bargaining coverage are generally associated with uh, greater equality in the distribution of wages. And uh, at this point, as uh, uh, the previous, the next slide uh, 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 clearly uh, goes on to suggest, it's worth uh, pausing uh, for a second on the effects that a very important uh, uh, draft instrument that is currently being discussed in the European institution about decent uh, uh, minimum wages in Europe, as already noted by the uh, previous speaker in the first part of the presentation, will have a generally transformative effect on millions of workers. As Oliver pointed out, and as uh, this uh, um, uh, a graph illustrates in greater detail, at the moment, we have 25 million workers in Europe that do not receive an adequate minimum wage calculated on the basis of 60% uh, of the national median and 50% of the national average wage. And this is a, a real mark of shame and a, a great generator of uh, uh, structural inequalities in European societies. And it's worth, well worth uh, noticing, as uh, Agnieszka already pointed out, that there is a clear gender bias in, uh, 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 in poverty wages, because uh, women tend to be overrepresented by reasons of uh, 
uh, vertical and horizontal segregation in all labor markets in Europe. In the low, they tend to be overrepresented in the lower uh, uh, income and wage percentiles. And therefore, uh, a measure such as the one that is currently being discussed and proposed in greater detail uh, by the ETUC and uh, the work that appears in chapter five will have a transformative effect on millions of women, in particular, uh, uh, the gender pay gap in countries like Romania would reduce by 25%, and even countries like Belgium uh, would benefit uh, uh, from uh, such a measure in terms of a gender um, pay gap. It should be clear that uh, uh, certainly collective bargaining and collective bargaining coverage uh, can have a transformative effect and egalitarian effect on labor markets and societies in Europe. But that in recent years, as pointed out by chapter three, but also pointed out in the last few years by benchmarking 20, uh, by benchmarking work in Europe, by our publication here at ATI, the coverage of collective bargaining has uh, fallen in uh, uh, most European countries. And it's uh, uh, certainly substantially uh, behind uh, any acceptable threshold uh, that would make a difference, and that uh, in the current directive proposal is set at around 70% uh, of uh, 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 the coverage for each member state. You can see that there's a substantial number of countries that are falling behind, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, countries big and small, countries from the north and from the south, countries from the east and from the west. Uh, but it's also clear that in order to reach uh, these thresholds, in order to push collective bargaining coverage to where it was approximately 20 years ago, so we're not talking about uh, the golden age of collective bargaining uh, in uh, uh, the second half of the 20th century, there will be a need for substantial institutional and political support. And the action plans that are currently being contemplated in uh, uh, Article 4 of the draft instrument uh, are an essential element in order to facilitate, facilitate this kind of uh, uh, transformative uh, effect of collective bargaining in, in terms of equal redistribution of uh, the wealth created. What we would like to pause before bringing uh, our presentation to an end for just a few minutes is also the uh, uh, huge and manifest levels of inequalities that arise from the interaction between uh, 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 income uh, and socioeconomic inequalities, but also the impact of climate change and the inequalities that that generates uh, in and of, its, uh, of itself. We are uh, uh, on the chapter uh, written by Bella and Meta clearly illustrate that in a very paradoxical situation. Uh, a paradoxical situation whereby those who are least responsible for climate change in terms of, uh, for instance, the carbon footprint and uh, the amount of CO2 that they generate, are those who are also most affected by the effects of climate change. And you can see it very clearly from these two graphs. The one on the left uh, really speaks uh, for, for itself. Uh, the top 1% uh, of uh, uh, the capital, the per percentile of Europe generates uh, almost uh, half of the carbon footprint, and the lowest percentile uh, uh, just as a very small, um, small amount. In in the next slide, uh, you can see how adversely affected uh, the uh, lower shares uh, of uh, the income brackets in Europe are by problems that are linked to the issue of environmental harm, and in particular, the issue of uh, energy poverty. Uh, you can see how uh, across uh, the member states that appear in, uh, 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 in, the, two, in, in the two graphs, uh, there is great inequality, for instance, in the, the quality of uh, dwellings, uh, that uh, people who are placed be below the 60% uh, median income uh, have to endure, uh, and similarly in terms of uh, energy poverty. The final slide that we have uh, selected for you again addresses the issue of uh, regulatory, of the importance of regulatory intervention 
uh, in order to achieve uh, uh, change, societal change, and more equal societies uh, in uh, Europe. As Agnieszka has pointed out, uh, there is uh, uh, an issue that has been particularly exacerbated by the pandemic and by the shift to telework uh, and uh, remote working is the issue of psychosocial risks. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, substantial regulatory gaps in a number of member states that are uh, technically uh, uh, incapable. Uh, it's, there is a regulatory gap and lacuna in a sh large share of uh, uh, member states to address effectively uh, uh, the challenges of uh, psychosocial risks, uh, including uh, aspects that deal with uh, uh, pre-pandemic and more mundane questions such as uh, uh, workplace bullying. And there is a genuine need for European level intervention in this domain as well. Uh, and uh, here there isn't an issue of competence. Uh, uh, it's just a question of political will to uh, fill this gap by creating a minimum floor of rights applying to all uh, European member states. Um, as Agnieszka already suggested, we could uh, uh, perhaps carry on for a couple of days presenting just the key findings uh, from uh, this publication, uh, but uh, you will be able to hear in the next part of the conversation, uh, both from some of our uh, uh, distinguished guests and from our, some of our distinguished authors, uh, uh, what other important points are raised by the publication and the issue of inequality uh, as a whole. Um, Paula, the floor is uh, yours. Now, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Agnieszka and Nicola, for this uh, concise overview uh, of some of the issues uh, in the benchmark in 2021. Uh, there is, of course, much more in the report, uh, which is now available online at the ETUI website. Um, now we would like to take the chance to discuss some of the issues that we have heard from our introductory speakers today with our three panelists. So we have Barbara Kaufman, we have MEP Evelyn Regner and Luca Vicentini in the panel. Um, a warm welcome to you all from my behalf as well. Now, uh, we, we just heard some key findings from the benchmarking report on inequality in Europe. And my first question uh, goes to Luca Vicentini. Um, what do you see as some of the structural solutions for the structural inequalities in Europe that we just heard about? Please look up floor is yours. Thank you, Paula. Uh, well, as I said before, I think that we need, uh, I would say, three fundamental instruments. The first one is the economy. Uh, we need to change the rules of the economic governance if we want to mobilize investment in a way that we can create equal jobs uh, and equal opportunities for all. There is no alternative in this respect. It's not the old kind of TINA, there is no alternative. It's a new type of TINA that we have to build up. And is the fact that there is no alternative to changing the rules and implement a more equal economic model if we want really to change these horrible distortions that exist in our labor market, in our economic development, and in our societies more in general. The second element is that we need to build a just transition. Uh, because uh, in addition to the economic crisis we have faced in the past and we are facing again now because of the pandemic, and uh, in addition uh, also to the uh, disruption that the pandemic has uh, led to in our economic economies and societies, we have also existing challenges that are going to escalate even further, the climate transition, the digital transition, and so on and so forth. These challenges that cannot be avoided, of course, are at risk of introducing even further inequalities in our, in our, in our societies, if they are not tackled properly. And to be very frank, it's not enough to offer some training or some social compensation to those in the communities that are going to be affected by the climate change and the digital change. We need to build a governance 
that can really put in place strategic industrial strategies to generate jobs in the same communities and uh, territories where the disruption is going to happen. And that put in, puts in place social dialogue, collective bargaining, workers' participation, full involvement of social partners uh, to accompany workers in the job transition. And then the money can be spent uh, in a proper manner. And third and last, uh, uh, instrument that we should develop further, of course, uh, is what we call the new social contract that is made of many things. It's made of, of, of reinforcing social uh, and public services, uh, is made of uh, reinforcing social rights and workers' rights through legislation, regulation, and action, and is made of uh, uh, reinforced social protection systems uh, that have really to become universally accessible and adequate in the coverage that they can provide to workers. Extension of uh, rights and protection to those that are excluded now is a fundamental element to resolve the different inequalities that have been uh, explained by Agnieszka and by Nicola. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Luca, for sharing the, the, the real, real solutions uh, upon which uh, the, 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 the structural uh, change to tackle the inequalities uh, should uh, be based. Um, my next question goes to uh, MEP Evelyn Regner. Now, uh, Agnieszka and Nicola highlighted that one of the key aspects of the inequalities in Europe continues to be gender inequality. Uh, which is apparent, for example, in the gender pay gap. Uh, what do you see as some of the solutions to eliminating the persisting gender inequalities in the world of work and also beyond? Please, Evelyn. Thank you very much. Uh, just, I have to say, this is a great tool. I really have to say this is already a great tool for so many years. And I really want to say that and speak it out loudly, uh, especially in times when we are always faced with uh, fake news and uh, uh, politics that is not based on facts and figures, it's so important to have benchmarking work in Europe um, and also this year. So on gender equality, I simply would like to underline everything that Luca has proposed right now, economic gov uh, uh, governance, climate transition, the whole transition, social contract. I mean, we need that and we need it in a completely gender balanced way. So uh, gender equality is not an appendix. Uh, one is scratching in the head and just saying, finally, ah, there was something on it. We have to do that in a complete gender equal way. We see that, and I give the example from the RRF uh, in the European Parliament, we put in, this has to be done in a completely uh, gender neutral way. So far it's gender blind. And then you just have the principle of gender equality and no percentage. What do you do then with that? You get national action plans and whatever for member countries that don't reflect that the corona pandemic is deepening, worsening, as Nicola pointed it out, existing inequalities, inequalities. And of course, the equality between men and women is existing forever. So. And this sharpens the situation. You just outlined those uh, examples. So do that, the full gender mainstreaming in the application of the new economic governance we definitely need. Second point, binding measures. Binding measures, whatever is done is always nice when we negotiate and do that in something where we just try to inspire companies and governments and whomever to respect gender equality. We just always see if there are no binding measures, forget about that. Collective agreements first, that's clear. Uh, but uh, you, we, we really need legislation. And therefore, a European minimum wage is, of course, an important tool to close the gender pay gap because it's amongst, uh, uh, when you just look who is uh, who's doing those uh, jobs that are really so poorly paid, it's above all women. Next step, transparency. This is something also that is needed. The pay transparency and not a blah, blah transparency, a real pay transparency. We are working on that, a binding measure. And for me, the topic for the trade union movement and also for Europe and the whole world of work is, let's talk about the value of work. And this means we are talking about this unpaid care work women are doing. Women have the choice to do 
for example, a part-time job, and then to do all this housework, or caring about children, cooking, uh, having the home empty load, or they can say, I work like hell, and I work really 60 hours a week, and then going home and doing the same. Uh, putting the rubbish in front, front of the door, caring about kids, caring about the, the mental load, or they can say, I give up, I stay at home, and I become financially un in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, financially dependent on men. And is this an option? No. And therefore, what is going on in Iceland, what is going on in New Zealand is really absolutely exciting to develop really objective criteria for work and then to compare, as I say, that apples, not only with apples, but apples with pears. For me, it's not logic that this fantastic work, those four uh, runners uh, in the society, those working uh, in the kindergartens, being exposed to corona more than others, those working at schools, those doing these fantastic care jobs with elderly and the health sector are so uh, less paid in comparison to other jobs. And in countries like New Zealand, Canada or Iceland, there is already objective instruments, criteria developed, and we absolutely should pick that up in the European Union in order to push equality at work. And there, of course, we need a strong trade union movement. Thank you. Thank you very much, NDP Evelyn Regner, for picking up on what Luca was highlighting as the three key issues in terms of the new economic governance, the overarching uh, challenge of climate change and the, the need for real uh, new social contracts, and then adding that to the mainstreaming aspects uh, for equality that also requires binding measures and, and uh, for example, a real pay transparency. Now, um, I, I have a question to next to Barbara Kaufmann from the European Commission. Now, the, uh, the benchmarking uh, analysis this year shows that the share of young people uh, who are not in employment, education or training has increased due to the COVID-19 crisis. And we also see that young people are overrepresented in the industries that were most hard hit by the pandemic. Um, could you tell us briefly how the European Commission is responding to this situation and ensuring that we do not end up with a whole generation that is being left behind? Thank you, Barbara. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, let me first say I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, panel and uh, have enjoyed very much the presentation and discussion so far. Uh, and also um, congratulations to the authors on this very interesting report. I cannot say I've read it up to the end, but I will still do. And I agree with what Evelyn said about the importance of evidence policy making and how important it is to have the numbers. I'm also in my direct responsible for various reports. And I can say, um, I mean, uh, we. Uh, think that the findings in this report very much are also in line with findings that, that we have. I would also like to say um, I welcome that it has been recognized that this time uh, the EU was better in responding to this major crisis than in previous crises. And in one of the findings, for instance, in our report is that um, let's say, uh, based on simulations and flash estimates, that perhaps on average in the EU, uh, inequality and poverty may not have increased last year. But then I don't want to leave it there and say, ah, now we are complacent, because it is true, as soon as you look at specific countries, population groups, uh, and, and specific areas like uh, health that Luca mentioned or so on, you see quickly that yes, there have been increased uh, inequalities and problems. And yes, I can say that we're very much concerned about the increase um, in needs um, and more generally that the increase in unemployment uh, was higher, double as fast actually the unemployment rate increased in, uh, in the crisis as compared to the average. Uh, so this issue of what is happening to the youth is uh, a long-standing uh, problem uh, because, for instance, already in 17 we looked at the intergenerational fairness of things, and but now through the crisis it has been uh, further aggrav aggravated. So yes, what we are doing, I mean, very quickly the Commission uh, came forward with a youth employment support package, um, and 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 this is now a reinforced youth. Uh, um, 
uh, youth guarantee as one of the key elements. What I wanted to highlight, for instance, it used to be for young and up to under 25, and now it's up to under 30. So this group, this very important group between uh, you know, 25 and 29 has also been included. And here, of course, the idea is that member states then have to provide within four months of becoming, uh, for a youth becoming unemployed or leaving formal education with an offer of, of adequate employment, continued education or apprenticeship. And I think this is a key element, but now, of course, member states have to roll that out and work on that. Secondly, also there was a recommendation uh, in the youth support package on, uh, on vocational education and training uh, that was uh, adopted by the council in, in, in June 21. And it creates for a more attractive, flexible and fit for the digital and green economy voc vocational education system, which I think will be uh, really important to prepare the young for, for new jobs. Then there are also other things like the renewed European Alliance for Apprenticeships, uh, and I will not go in all, to de all, the, all, all the details now, but I can say that, for instance, the former uh, version of the European Alliance uh, helped uh, since 2013 to, to provide for 900,000 opportunities, and also the previous youth guarantee allowed for, for, for three and a half uh, million uh, young people to receive such offers that I mentioned. Now, the new element uh, that uh, our president announced will be a, a scheme called ALMA, Aim, Learn, Master and Achieve. And I think I should particularly highlight it because it's specifically aimed to the needs. So we have had uh, programs like Erasmus, which are very successful, but they help people that have tertiary education. And here the specific focus is on those that are more in, in precarious situations. So even if the program, the size of the program is relatively limited, I think it has the right focus and it also uh, helps the young, not only when they're abroad to find these uh, uh, opportunities, but also to help them integrate in a job when they come back home. I think that's something worthwhile. Uh, other programs that are not specifically targeted to the young, like Sure and Ease, uh, okay, were mentioned. They were also mentioned in the sense that not all uh, those in precarious situations were reached. Maybe in the next year's uh, evaluation of ease, maybe things like that could also be looked at. Uh, uh, and maybe finally, let me say that, of course, uh, all these actions are supported by the ESF. Uh, and here we have the provision that uh, member states, which have a serious situation, have to put at least 12.5% of their funding to, the, uh, to address the problem of the needs and uh, as far as the recovery and resilience uh, facility is concerned, what is uh, in our data so far is 30% of these uh, plans have uh, financing for social and 11% uh, are actually directed to, to addressing the problems of the youth. I heard what was said earlier by Luca about the quality and that it's important that we see how these programs are rolled out, but I still think it goes in the right direction. So. I think with all these elements, I hope that we can make a contribution to the reaching the target that by 2030, there would be only 9% compared to 12% uh, now. And I would also finally say that in our next ESTA report, one of our flagship reports, we will focus on youth for the second time now in five years, uh, because we think it is really important to look at all elements also going beyond the labor market and so on. So thank you very much, Esther. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, for the, uh, for the snapshots of the initiatives of the European Commission to tackle inequalities that young people face and um, particularly importantly, the, the needs, the, the young people not in employment, education or training. Um, and now let's dive into a little bit deeper into the, uh, the anal analysis of this year's benchmarking report and take another look into some of the findings. And uh, I would like to invite my colleague uh, Sotiria Theodoropoulou to give a brief five minute introduction into the broad area of macroeconomic and financial developments and policies in the EU in 2021. Sotiria, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Paula. Thanks to everyone who's uh, attending here today. Um, in the five minutes that I have, uh, I will try to uh, go through some very basic uh, developments at the macroeconomic level, look into some uh, indicators of inequalities within and uh, between uh, among member states, uh, especially income, uh, try to link those to some of the economic policy responses and uh, reflect a bit on what the pandemic has taught us about economic policies uh, and what the uh, remaining open questions are. Uh, I'll try to keep it brief because uh, I have the impression that we are running a little bit uh, late, so I'll, uh, I'll go through uh, some of the slides that you can find in the publication pretty quickly, uh, and if there are questions, I'm happy to answer. So, um, the first thing that one could say about the pandemic was that the economic in impacts and recoveries have been uh, pretty uh, uneven. Um, we see uh, in this uh, figure here, there is a dotted line that shows the real GDP level in 2019, and then the red dots represent... Uh, Soteria, the we, Soteria yes? sorry, we can't see your presentation. Try to share Oh, it. I haven't... Yeah. Sorry. Um, it's a lot of books so and desks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's lost. <laughs> No, it's coming up. If you just uh, make it Can a full presentation. Yes. yes. Make it a full Is that screen. okay now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so um, as I said, the, yeah, uh, to, to, to get you back to the figure, the dotted line shows the real GDP level in 2019. Uh, so we see the red dots show us the, the, the range uh, in which uh, real GDP declined in 2020. Uh, we see that most member states uh, um, had losses with uh, an exception of uh, two, Ireland and uh, Lithuania, which were very small. Uh, we see at the uh, upper, uh, upper end of the of the figure that uh, uh, countries mostly uh, in the southern periphery and those uh, relying a lot on the tourism sector uh, had the biggest losses um, now in 20 for, for 2021 the latest forecasts uh, by the European Commission suggest that uh, uh, growth has turned back into being positive so we have had recoveries however uh, only 13 member states will have will see the real GDP recovery covering to its uh, 2019 real GDP levels uh, in the course of this year. Um, and uh, everyone should have gone back to their real GDP levels by 2022, with the exception of Spain. Of course, these uh, uh, forecasts uh, are subject to significant uncertainty, as we see with the emergence of new variants that um, uh, the, the, the reaction to which the response to which uh, uh, is still uh, unclear. Um, Moving on now to uh, inequalities in living standards and quality of life across and within uh, member states. Uh, what these two figures um, try to show is that uh, we have had inequalities pre-existed, predated the pandemic. So on the left side figure, we see GDP per capita and PP in uh, purchasing power standard uh, uh, in EU member states and the UK. And we see that the uh, um, the the, there is a wide uh, difference in the level. So, um, uh, in uh, the, the real G the GDP per capita in Luxembourg was uh, um, uh, much higher than that in Bulgaria. It was. Uh, um, over um, uh, almost five times as high, whereas the EU27 uh, average was uh, almost twice as high as that of Bulgaria. So we see that there is a, there, were, there were very uh, large disparities in income uh, in GDP per capita. Of course, GDP per capita is probably the most comprehensive uh, indicator we have uh, of living standards, but it has its limitations. So uh, just as a, as an in, as an indication, I have also looked into self-report and meant needs for medical examination because it was too uh, uh, expensive, uh, people could not afford it. Uh, so we see that while in the vast majority of member states, uh, these were virtually zero, so there were virtually no people reporting that they could not uh, have a medical examination because it was too expensive for them. Uh, we still have quite a few of them where, uh, uh, you know, these um, uh, 
So this percentage of respondents uh, uh, ranged from 7.5% in Greece um, uh, and others where it was positive. And these are striking figures because one has to remember that the EU is a club of, if we look at the, if we look at it globally, it's a club of rich uh, countries. So to have people that cannot uh, um, afford to have medical examination is quite a striking uh, finding. Um, now to move on to uh, indicators of uh, income inequality. Um, I show here on the left side the income quantile share ratio, uh, which shows the, the, how much, uh, what share of the income the top 20% of um, uh, the income distribution commands compared to the top, uh, to the lowest 20%. And what uh, I would like to point out here is that um, uh, in fact, okay, on the one hand, there is again, there are again large uh, disparities. That ratio uh, was about eight in Bulgaria uh, in 2019 and more or less in 2020, whereas it was uh, as low as uh, 3 around 3% uh, in Slovakia and a little bit above that in Czechia. But what I think is interesting in this figure is that um, uh, between 2019 and 2020, despite the large shock that uh, EU European economies uh, uh, underwent, um, this indicator held up. The, the increases in the in the in this uh, ratio were not the increases in income inequality were not as uh, sub substantial. In fact, in uh, quite a few member states, we see that uh, there was even a slight decrease. Uh, we get uh, a similar uh, picture in the at-risk uh, poverty rate indicator on the right-hand side uh, figure. Again, we see that there are very large disparities. There were very large disparities among member states in 2019 and 2020. But overall, with the exception of two, three member states, uh, this indicator did not deteriorate between uh, 2019 and 2020, which uh, one could say that uh, this seems to suggest that the public support measures that were rolled out uh, in Europe, but also elsewhere in the world, seem to have had some impact in cushioning the impacts of, uh, um, of uh, uh, households and individuals uh, from the uh, impact, from, from the effect of the crisis that one can also see, uh, especially in terms of employment in the uh, chapters uh, three and four of, uh, sorry, two and three of this volume. Um, so to move on then to, um, public policy responses. Uh, the figure that you can see here is how uh, um, general government budget primary deficits uh, evolved between 2019 and then uh, 2020 and what the forecasts are for 2021 um, uh, yeah, and 2022. So the red lines show that in 2019, most member states were uh, more or less in line, or except for, with the exception of uh, one or two, were in line with uh, uh, the EU rule that uh, says that they should be, their budget deficit should be below 3%. Um, but then we saw that, we, we can see that uh, from 2020, uh, with the activation of the general escape clause of stability and growth pact, uh, uh, budget deficits were allowed to balloon in order to uh, cushion uh, the effect of the crisis, uh, governments uh, started uh, spending a lot. Um, what you, uh, we don't see here, uh, but it was other policy responses where uh, the ECB support programs, um, uh, whereby it uh, uh, engaged in lar large purchases of uh, uh, corporate and public uh, assets, uh, especially government bonds in the uh, financial markets, which, which kept uh, interest uh, borrowing costs for governments low. So we had this uh, combined, um, uh, you know, uh, policy response uh, from the EU level. On the one hand, the fiscal rules uh, were suspended. On the other hand, the ECB uh, was pretty much buying a lot of uh, uh, the debt that was being issued in the secondary market. Uh, at the same time, keeping interest rates low and uh, making sure it provided uh, uh, the banking system with uh, cheap liquidity that they could then uh, uh, try to provide to the real economy. Uh, we had, of course, uh, other uh, uh, 
pu public policy interventions. Uh, probably the one that uh, I should mention at this point, I think everybody knows about SURE and the changes in the EU state aid framework. Uh, but what we have was the big agreement in uh, July 2020 on the uh, next EU budget, the current now current EU budget and the next generation EU uh, pillar with its recovery and resilience facility. Um, I would just like to um, uh, try to conclude then now um, on what these policy responses have been uh, showing us uh, from the pandemic. So the first point that I would like to make is that uh, what we have seen is that it seems that if there is a will, there is a way. As John Maynard Keynes had said in 1942, anything we can actually do, we can afford. Um, so it, it appeared as if uh, uh, um, governments, uh, it was it was the, the sort of the consensus among policymakers around the world was that governments should indeed do whatever it takes to support their economies against the shock. And this is exactly what happened. So uh, in the case of the EU, we saw that that uh, fiscal rules were suspended. Uh, the EU acquired a temporary fiscal capacity, which had been, uh, you know, a quest for for years, uh, especially since the EMU was established, but uh, never really saw the light of the day. At the same time, we saw the European Central Bank uh, engaging in unprecedented. Um, uh, monetary financing, one should say, by buying most of the debt that had been uh, issued by EU government, Eurozone governments in the markets. Um, so the question is, from now on, given that uh, several of these, uh, at least the, 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 the next generation EU, the fiscal capacity for the EU is a temporary measure, um, uh, given that uh, the EU economic governance reform, how should we be uh, um, uh, reforming the fiscal rules from now on, uh, the, this, this debate has been relaunched, this process has been relaunched, and also given that the European Central Bank uh, adopted a new monetary policy strategy which is due for evaluation and new review if necessary by 2024, how can we harness this uh, fiscal and monetary policies in Europe in order to tackle inequalities and engineer a timely just transition to a decarbonized economy and society. Um, will we rethink the original Maastricht allocation of functions among them? Um, and who should be deciding for uh, on that? Um, the, the, the point that I would like to make here is whether, uh, I mean, one very big open question is uh, whether there should be some more explicit coordination between fiscal and monetary policies, because, for example, what the European Central Bank has been doing uh, by buying uh, government bonds in the markets uh, has had a very uh, benefit has had good effects for supporting uh, the response to the crisis. Um, so one could say that it's a benevolent um, uh, policy development, but at the same time, uh, it is a decision that the European Central Bank is doing on its own. At the center, at the same time, the European Central Bank has been. Um, uh, expanding its uh, activities to support more its what we call its secondary mandate, so going beyond price stability. Uh, but these activities have uh, distributional consequences. So there is a question of who, whether the European Central Bank should be deciding on how to pursue the secondary mandate on its own, and um, whether ultimately we should be as I said, rethinking this original Maastricht allocation of functions by thinking whether uh, we should uh, get the European Central Bank policies to explicitly support uh, public policies, fiscal policies in engineering this just transition and in dealing with problems like uh, inequality. And with that, um, I will stop my presentation here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sotiria, uh, for, for sharing the analysis and your reflections and raising the questions. And um, it was very interesting. We heard you said that the share of people uh, at risk of poverty was lower in 2020, the first year of the pandemic, than in 2019, which uh, illustrates the effectiveness of public support programs. And uh, prompted by this uh, finding in the benchmark in 2021 analysis, I would like to ask uh, Luca Vicentini, uh, what do you see as the key elements in the uh, fiscal and monetary uh, policies that can tackle inequality, also in the light of the just transition? Look at the floor is yours. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Paula. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, uh, the brilliant presentation of Soteria has shown very clearly that there is an alternative. Uh, and also quoting, I mean, uh, Keynes, uh, it's very clear that uh, it's possible to implement different measures and a different economic policy. And when you do that, uh, the effects are visible. You can really have an impact in terms of reducing poverty, reducing inequalities, uh, increase the share among the society of the benefits uh, of growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in this respect, I think that the key element here is not to give up, not to come back to the previous policies, but on the contrary, to continue uh, uh, along the path that has been drawn by uh, the very ambitious decisions, uh, as also Barbara Kaufman was emphasizing, that the European Union, for the first time, I have to say, in decades, uh, was able to take in the last year and a half. In this respect, I would like to emphasize some key elements that could really make a change also for the future. The first one is that the extraordinary emergency measures that have been deployed, uh, investment on health care systems, first of all, and then on businesses and workers uh, to sure and the EIB extraordinary measures, uh, these instruments have not only to continue, but they have to be turned into permanent macroeconomic stabilizers, because we have to be ready next time that we will face a crisis uh, with instruments that are already tested, are permanently financed in a way that uh, we don't have to rebuild or reinvent the wheel uh, from scratch uh, when we will face another crisis. The second element is that this time we need to orientate and steer the way the enormous amount of money for investment that has been is going to be mobilized through next generation EU, the, the way this money will be spent. We cannot just give it to the markets, you know, and hope that the markets will fix the problem. This time we have to make sure that every single euro of public money that will be given to the economy is turned into quality job creation. We need to measure this. We cannot leave it just to a random, uh, you know, hope that something positive will happen because we have already seen in the past that is not happening. If you don't have control mechanisms, conditionalities uh, and the monitoring mechanism, it, do it just doesn't happen because, of course, the markets privilege increasing profits and not uh, having a, a positive impact in the society. Third element uh, is wages. Uh, this time, the wage share has to improve. We have to make sure that we have a real dynamic that uh, pushes uh, upward wage convergence uh, in the European Union, in the European single market. I had a very recent conversation in the framework of the macroeconomic dialogue with the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, that was asking the social partners why wages are not increasing enough uh, in the European Union saying that the current explosion of inflation is not due at all to wage increases. On the contrary, it is prices, uh, uh, speculation, energy speculation, etc., etc. So she was asking the social partners, us in Business Europe, what can you do to make sure that we can have a positive wage dynamic? Well, the employers were not able to reply. We said collective bargaining, collective bargaining, collective bargaining, because the countries where you have real collective bargaining covering everybody in an efficient dynamic, well, those countries, in those countries, you have wage equality and also wage in improvements. The fourth element is that we need an industrial strategy. It's not enough to spend public money without a purpose. And the European Union for too long has refused to establish an European level industrial strategy. Every single country pursues its own objectives in terms of industry and energy. Uh, this is really detrimental for the single market to make sure that the single market can compete in the global dimension. So it's really time to reform our competition rules, to reform our state aid rules, to make sure that we can really boost an industrial strategy that is also fundamental to manage just transition. And fifth, last but not least, we have to start considering universal social protection systems to which everybody can have access after having contributed to that, we have to consider universal social protection systems as a fundamental macroeconomic stabilizer, as an element that can boost competitiveness and inclusion and cohesion in our economies. If we try these things, 
And if we try to be consistent in pursuing these things, we can really achieve something. I don't repeat what uh, Sotiria has already emphasized about the fact that we have to change the fiscal rules. We have to rethink uh, the role of the European Central Bank. Uh, some of the secondary uh, scopes and tasks of the European Central Bank have to be part of the primary objectives of the bank. I mean, full employment and uh, environmental sustainability. They have to become the core of the action of the European Central Bank. And we need also to make sure that uh, the fact that we were able to create European debt, be very frank, let's be very frank on this. We have created European debt and it was the right choice. And we have to continue to do it because otherwise it will be impossible for the single member, individual member states uh, to cope with this, uh, with this incredible uh, uh, challenges. So this means imagining an, if a different economic model. We are all talking about beyond GDP, economy of well-being. We have to tell everybody what this means in practice. This means macroeconomic decisions, macroeconomic, microeconomic decisions uh, to make a change really real for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Luca Vicentini, for really showing that there is an alternative and there is a possibility for different uh, economic model and really uh, putting the, the elements in place uh, that need to be there. Um, I've understood you need to lead to another meeting, so I would also like to thank you for, for your uh, input today. And, um, and we congratulations will... really to all of you for the excellent job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we will now um, move on. We will have a brief presentation, a five minute presentation um, from Professor uh, Kate Pickett, uh, who will tell us how the impact of COVID-19 has been shaped by the entrenched and interacting inequalities that actually predate the pandemic. Now, the floor is yours, uh, Professor Pickett. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, everybody. Um, for being here today. Thank you for asking me to contribute the guest editorial for this year's benchmarking report. That was a real privilege. Um, I think we're running very close up against our end time, aren't we? So I'm going to be exceptionally brief. Let me see if I can um, share my screen. And Yes, you can see that now. I did notice that there was a question in the chat that I wanted to address before we ran out of time, um, but it also was a chat relevant to what I wanted to say. So I'll just make five really, really quick points so that, so that Simon can contribute as well. One is that we need to... It seems that there is a connection problem, uh, Kate. We cannot hear you. Um, okay, Kate, can you hear us? No. Right. Um, then I suggest that we would move on uh, to the next uh, uh, present, uh, presentation. Um, that what would be uh, this would be from. Uh, Professor, yes, I think Kate's we dropped Kate. Okay, but uh, Professor Simon Deeking, uh, would you be happy to uh, to step in now and ready to present? Yes. So uh, Professor Deeking ooh, is is going to tell us about the industrial democracy and inequality based on his re uh, research. Uh, Professor Deeking, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. Um, can you see my screen? No. No. Not yet. Hmm. It, well, it seems it's coming up, but... Um... It's coming, I think. Um, can you actually hear me? Yes. yes. Um, let, let, me, let me say something uh, very briefly about my paper. I'm not sure the screen share is working, to be honest. Uh, let me see if I can make it do this. Oh, yeah, hang on. That's it. Yeah. Very first, yeah, it's a great pleasure, firstly, to be able to contribute to the report and also to be able to take part in this um, session this morning, I've been doing some research on industrial democracy and inequality, and let me be very brief. I'll first of all show you a chart of changes in co-determination laws over time. And what this shows is that the, the peak period for growth in laws governing co-determined boards and works councils was the 1970s. And there was quite a lot of progress made then in improving workers' rights. When these curves go up, worker rights get 
uh, stronger. If anybody's interested in the methodology about all this, I suggest you contact me afterwards. Now, the second chart shows that since the um, early 1990s, on the other hand, there have been very significant changes in the laws governing shareholder rights. And these are rights um, which shareholders can and do exercise to put pressure on managers to uh, prioritize their interests inside the governance of the firm. So industrial democracy cuts both ways. Sometimes workers have voice through co-determined boards and works councils, and sometimes uh, workers have voice, um, uh, shareholders have voice through laws which strengthen their influence. And there's been a very significant strengthening in the influence of shareholder rights over time, in part thanks to various EU directives, such as the 13th Company Law Directive and other measures which were adopted uh, across the uh, block, and in particular in the so-called accession or post-transition states in the mid 2000s. And the bottom line here is that um, over time, labor rights uh, in the EU have been more or less staying still. If you just look at law, there hasn't been actually a massive deregulation in co-determination or indeed in employment protection laws across Europe. It's important to emphasize that. But what has really happened is that shareholder rights have been getting stronger. So the, the balance between labor and capital has absolutely tilted inside the firm in favor of capital. And in particular, um, laws governing independent boards or codes of practice uh, and also governing takeover bids, um, those are really influential in tilting the balance of power within corporate governance away from labor towards capital. We know from other research that when shareholder rights increase, there's a correlation with growing um, inequality with a rise in the capital share versus a labor share. And we also know that labor laws do stop the labor share falling more quickly than it otherwise would have done. And also we know that there's a correlation between uh, increasing shareholder rights and health inequalities. Now, how would that happen? Well, various mechanisms, but um, essentially uh, as more income from profits is devoted to dividends and share buybacks and the wage share goes down and inequality goes up, we see knock-on effects on health inequality, including rising child mortality rates among lower income groups. That, that's evidence from Ferguson et al, in, interesting paper. And we also know that over time, um, increasing shareholder rights in these ways does not have the hoped for benefits. Uh, we see that actually innovation tends to go down when uh, shareholder rights go up because firms tend to invest less, they return capital to shareholders and a lot of that doesn't go into investment, it goes into speculation in assets, including land. Uh, we also know that on the whole, uh, when labor representation rights, such as co-determination rights and collective bargaining rights as well are strengthened, there are strong positive correlations with productivity and employment growth, at least over the medium term. And we also know that so-called capital shallowing, uh, which is another way of putting this, that when uh, labor is relatively less expensive compared to capital, which is what these laws are achieving, um, then labor replaces capital, and that's a major cause of the productivity slowdown. Uh, and it does also lead to uh, job creation, which is largely casual, precarious, and low paid. Okay, I'll stop there because we're very short of time and hopefully be able to hand back to, um, hand back to Kate. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for sharing some of the findings uh, on the relationship between industrial democracy and inequality that are based uh, on the impressive amount of data actually uh, from the Cambridge uh, Leximetric database. Um, let's see, yes, we Kate is back uh, on Zoom with us, so uh, I'll hand the floor directly over to, to Kate to, to discuss the inequality. Thank you, Paula. Thank you. I don't know what happened to my Zoom link, but never mind. I won't try and share a screen again, and, and I will be exceptionally brief. Um, I did want to say thank you for inviting me to contribute the guest editorial um, to this year's benchmarking report. That's been, that's been a real privilege. So I'll just make five really quick points because we have heard so much impressive and interesting um, information today. One is that we do need to recognize that the evidence of the harm brought by inequality. The evidence is robust and growing all the time. We understand extremely well both the wide range of social, economic and health problems that are created by inequality, but we also understand those causal pathways, how they happen, 
and we do know very much what we need to do about those things. Um, I also wanted to address the question that somebody had put in the Q&A who asked about what about racial and ethnic inequalities and the important thing to recognize that inequalities are, are interconnected. And in the report, we do include a framing of, of how the vertical inequalities of power, of wealth, of income, of opportunity intersect with the horizontal inequalities of geography, of where you live, but also of your identity, whether that's belonging to an ethnic minority, which gender you belong to, whether you have a disability, etc. And inequalities intersect, interact, and become entrenched through that, and they all need to be tackled um, at source. Oh, thank you. Somebody, somebody's sharing sharing that figure. And so if you think about one inequality without thinking about the others, you will not tackle those entrenched and intersecting inequalities. You will not create well-being and quality of life for everybody. The third point I wanted to make is that we must think about life course. This report is very much focused on, on working age people, but um, it's already been pointed out that we need to think about young people. And of course, we know that if we want to tackle the intergenerational perpetuation of inequality, then we need to think about the early years as well. We need to think about family formation and supporting, supporting pregnant women um, and supporting those, those early years development. The fourth thing I wanted to say was that, and this has been touched on by others, that inequality is at the heart of many crises. Inequality shaped how different societies managed to cope with the pandemic. And we now have evidence that those with greater income inequality had worse pandemics, more excess deaths. Um, but inequality shapes how we're going to deal with um, all of the pandemics that might be coming in the future. All of the pandemics we also ha already have in addition to COVID, pandemics of obesity, air pollution, etc. It shapes how we're going to respond to any future economic crisis, the next global financial crisis, and it shapes, of course, how we interact with the environment. So inequality is key to getting to ensuring that our economy and our society and our interactions with nature are creating well-being for people and the planet. And the final thing, the thing I'll finish on, is that I am always surprised by how survey after survey tells us that the public support a reduction in inequality, that the public are concerned that inequalities have grown too large and are damaging. So we have the public support, we have the data and the evidence, we have the, the thinking that we need. Now we just need the political will and the enactment of the policies that are going to ensure that we do create a better world for people post-COVID pandemic. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pickett, for really bringing home the message that inequality causes damage. We know this and the time to act is now. Um, and therefore I would last like to ask the final uh, question to MEP uh, Ringmer. Uh, what are your uh, three key action points towards more equal societies? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, even we'll uh, mention only two. We have to be brief. Uh, one is I don't want to leave uh, uh, this uh, fantastic presentation of the Benchmarking Work in Europe uh, 2021 on equalities without having said tax the rich. I mean, we see rich getting richer, poor poorer, this has to be a workers' issue uh, to talk, not only to talk, to go very in-depth uh, on debating where we could work on wealth taxes, where we could work on uh, in heritage taxes. Sorry, I don't know the exact word. Simply to leave out the word taxes and the complete imbalance, because this is, of course, reflected in all the inequalities you uh, were dealing with. And the second, the key words are always diverse, diversity and inclusion. So uh, when we talk about equal societies, they are, uh, a company can be in the long term time only sustainable and reflect climate change, intergenerational problems, uh, gender equality issues, if the society, the whole society is pictured, is mirrored in there. So that means we need uh, uh, the intersectional approach that also workers with migrant background, LGBTIQ uh, uh, society members, women, 
are reflected in company boards, that you see them uh, in the collective bargaining teams, that you see them uh, in the ECB, that you see them in politics, at the, at the uh, leadership. And therefore, we absolutely have to go on with all our legislative work and our political work simply to work on the full diversity and inclusion, then we have uh, stronger uh, societies. Thank you very much, MEP uh, Velin Regner. Uh, and finally, Barbara Kaufman, your three uh, key action points towards uh, more equal societies. Yes, thank you very much. I think it's a bit uh, uh, difficult, if not impossible, to say that or ask me that, considering that you know we have the pillar of social rights and uh, put forward in March uh, an action plan with 65 actions, which are all uh, about uh, uh, more social Europe. And uh, uh, okay, I and this was of course welcomed in Porto. So I have say a few points around this. First, I wanted to say uh, this pillar action plan also set three ambitious headline targets uh, in the area of employment, in the area of skills, and in the area of poverty reduction. And these were set at the EU level. And what is now needed is that member states also come forward with their own national targets, and they have to be equally ambitious, otherwise we're not going to you know, add this up to the EU ambition for 2030. Then in terms of the areas, let me just go very quickly through it. The first area is employment, and there was a lot uh, already said about the uh, minimum uh, wage um, initiative of the Commission, and indeed we are moving into an area where we hope that on Monday maybe the the Council will reach a general approach after the Parliament agreed on a mandate and we might move soon into trilogue. That would be an important step forward when it comes to both minimum wage, but also in terms of promoting social dialogue and collective bargaining. Uh, in the area of employment, I would also like to say that next week the Commission is planning to come forward with this initiative on working conditions of platform workers. So it's not only about, uh, you know, um, uh, wages, but also working conditions. And the third area in that I wanted to mention is asbestos. As far as the skills is concerned, skills, skills, skills means we need to roll out the skills pack. The commission comes next week with uh, two new initiatives, uh, individual learning and micro credentials. And it's clear that we will not uh, move forward in this very you know, complicated and, and challenging period if we don't ensure also the access of skills, access to skills for all groups, including those uh, with my, migrant background, women, and so on and so on. And then finally, when it comes to um, the area of social protection, social inclusion, uh, the Youth guarantee was mentioned, but there's also the child guarantee. It needs to be rolled out. Uh, the commission will come forward with a minimum income uh, uh, initiative. And finally, we are also on the 14th, and it's something I'm also working on, like uh, the minimum wage initiative, with a recommendation to all member states to ensure that the green transition will be fair. And that means looking at all different kinds of aspects, including taxation, including support to uh, jobs and so on and so on. Okay, so I've gone a little bit further than three action points, sorry about that, but I hope I was still uh, rather brief. And of course, I've heard what was said about the need for money and the governance reform, but of course, this is still ongoing and I cannot comment any further on that at this stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara Kaufman, and, and big thank you to all the presenters and the panelists for this excellent uh, discussion. I hand over to Nicola at the ETUI studio now for some final remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paula. Thank you very much to all the speakers uh, today, to the uh, important effort, including on the technical side by my colleagues. It is uh, extremely clear uh, that uh, inequality is uh, well placed on the map. Uh, it's a central issue uh, for uh, uh, this generation of policymakers to resolve and uh, uh, our uh, uh, work here at the ETUI uh, to continue to keep it on the agenda for as long as it will be necessary. Uh, alongside the issue, of course, of uh, uh, sustainability and transformation of uh, our economic system in a way that uh, both uh, 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 
the issue of uh, uh, sustainable uh, development and fair and equal uh, development can be tackled uh, together. We'll continue to do so in uh, months and in the coming years with uh, a network uh, of uh, uh, friends, uh, supporters, stakeholders, uh, and of course uh, in unison with uh, the labor movement that we are uh, privileged to uh, work so close uh, so close with, and also with some of you uh, on this screen. So uh, please uh, do keep following uh, our work. Uh, uh, we will uh, continue to hammer out uh, the message that you've heard uh, today. Inequality is a structure of problems. It requires structural solutions. And as Luca put it, we're indeed in uh, a new dimension of the there is no alternative. Uh, uh, debate. There is no alternative but change. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. much. It was a real pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> May I take one? Of course. Yes, okay. absolutely. Great, great. Because, These are, uh, of course, I have them all now. Yes, yes. Yeah, you have send a paper you the uh, final, final production of the copy. This is a pre